So let's prove this theorem that every planar graph has a far plane orientation. <coughs> So for that, we need some tool to determine which orientations are Fafian. So let's prove this lemma first. An orientation of G is Fafian if the following condition holds. It's not if and only if, but uh, it gives you one sufficient condition for the orientation to be Fafian. For every cycle, which satisfy the condition that uh, once we have deleted the vertices of the cycle from the graph, it has a perfect matching. And for those cycles, the number of backward oriented edges C in C is odd. What it means is that uh, once we take a C in a graph and we are considering graph G with uh, even number of vertices so if there is a perfect matching outside then C itself is an even cycle and according to this orientation, these edges are oriented. If you count it in a clockwise direction, then there are only one backward edge. Counterclockwise direction, there are three backward edges. And since C itself is an even cycle, and then number of backward edges in first orientation and number of backward edges in second orientation sums up to the all edges. So if one of them is odd, the other one is odd. So we can just casually say number of backward oriented edge is odd. I mean without specifying I mean one of these two orientation of C that we can take. So this lemma in this lemma this statement is clear. <coughs> and to prove this lemma that uh, we need to show that this orientation is Fafian. So this orientation gives you a skew symmetric oscillation symmetric A. And it determines the weight of its perfect matching M. And we need to show that for two perfect matchings, weight of these two are same. But we will only consider two perfect matchings, M and M prime, satisfying the condition that M symmetric difference with M prime is a C. Let's say this is a C, which is a cycle. It's enough to only consider this because if you have two matchings M and M prime. We take the union, then it's disjoint union of even cycles and edges. And if you consider this, say M, And what you do is you consider this M and you choose one of the even cycle here. And then you flip the edges. So instead of taking this black edges, you add this blue edge to get another, say, matching M1. And you get M2 by choosing another even cycle you haven't taken before. And then you do the same thing. So instead of these three, you choose these three edges here. You flip. You keep doing that until you flip all the even cycles, even cycles of length at least four, then you will end up with this M. And if we know that weight of M 
is same with weight of m1 which is same as weight of m2 dot 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 until the weight of m prime then you show that two arbitrary matchings have the same weight <coughs> so this is only inequality that you need to show is that the once there are two matchings which satisfy this relation so how do we get this by flipping only one even cycle so once you take the union of this then every other edges are just edge and there are only one cycle of length at least four so in there if you take the symmetric difference this is just cycle so it's sufficient to show that these two matchings have the same weight and let's see the i1 to i2s we know this is an even cycle because this is a symmetric difference of two matching let's say i sub 2s plus 1 is i1 then what do we know again here if its symmetric difference is c then outside of c we have these edges which are cancelled out which belong to both perfect matching which covers all the vertices then c minus the vertices in c contains a perfect matching And also with this naming, the number of, say, arcs ik plus 1 to ik in the orientation, the reverse-oriented one, I mean edges, with the k in between 1 and 2 s is odd by the assumption say it's t this odd number let's give the name of t and let tau be, a per, be the permutation such that tau i k is i k plus one and its identity outside the vertices in C. <coughs> so, now we need to show that weight of M and weight of M prime is same. For that, as the definition of weight requires um, permutation sigma which is corresponded to m so we let sigma be a permutation which is associated with m such that sigma i i mean let not just write i sigma k is i sub k for all k to first two s numbers so again sigma is some permutation such that in each it's partitioned into block and each block we want to add the edge of the m Now, I mean, I forgot to say that. And let's say I1, I2 is in M. So C is the symmetric difference of M and M prime. So, and I1, I2 is in M. So I1, I2 is in M. I3, I4, I5, I6, I7, I8, I9, I10. <coughs> Thank you.
And there are more. I mean, because M has edges outside of C as well, but there you just, I mean, assign it in arbitrary way. We don't really care, as long as it makes sense. I mean, if M has outside of C, there are like two numbers that match it, then you can put it here in, arbit in any order. It doesn't matter. And sigma prime be the permutation associated with m prime such that sigma prime is tau composition with sigma. So it means that sigma prime is simply 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Here, instead of i1, you add i2 and i3. i4, i5, i6, i7, i8, i9. In this way. Because in this C, so let's say C is, so M is I1, I2, I3, I4, I5, I6. Then in C, in M prime, we need to pair these two, these two, these two, which is this. But it's indeed composition of tau and sigma because tau sends I1 to I2 and I2 to I3. So this is composition. And rest of them is you just put the identical way as sigma. <coughs> so now we have the representation representation for the matching. So we can actually compute the weight. Then let's see. Sine of sigma prime is actually minus sine of sigma because this c is an even cycle you can check that this tau has a old sign this is old permutation so the ch sign changes moreover what's the weight of m times weight of m prime Weight of m and weight of m prime, if you multiply it, then that's the sine of sigma prime. I mean, sine of sigma times the a i sigma i and sine of sigma prime and multiplication of, no, sorry, sigma 2i minus 1 sigma 2i times sine of sigma prime where a sigma prime 2i minus 1 sigma prime 2i so this is the weight but if this i uh, let's just write j instead this j is bigger than 2s then what happened? This term and this term, if j is bigger than 2s, they are lying in this block, there it's identical. So those numbers are all identical. So once they are multiplied together, they are either one or negative one, but it's square is always one. So we can forget that. So we only have to consider the case where j is at most 2s. And if it's at most 2s, then what's multiplied is sine of, sine of, I mean, these two have the different sign, that's, so that's just the uh, negative one. And then you multiply sigma i and sigma i, j and j plus, plus, j plus, uh, j plus one. These are, just the uh, i1 
So if the AI1, I2, AI2, I3, AI2S, I1. <coughs> And in this permutation, if the given orientation makes is also in the same direction, then these are positive. If, it, if it's backward, it's oriented backward, then this is negative. And we know that only odd number of them are oriented backward. So, this is simply negative 1, and t of them are backward, negative 1 to t, which is 1. So, weight of m times weight of m prime is 1. And they are either 1 or negative 1, but their multiplication is 1 implies that m and m prime has the same weight. So this finishes the proof that such an orientation is Fafian. So if we know that uh, for every cycle C, <coughs> and once we delete the vertices in C, then the remaining thing is perfect matching, then the for such cycle C has the odd number of backward arc backward edge in the orientation, then it is Fafia. <coughs> so using that, we can prove uh, this. So now we will prove this for planograph. The planograph, for planograph, we, what we want to do is we want to prove that in the planograph, all the cycle C satisfying this, I mean, with some orientation that we give, we can make sure that all such cycles have the, I mean, odd number of backward edges. So that's what we want to prove. But considering all the cycles, are, I mean, too much. I mean, there are many things to consider. So instead, let's see that, let's show that the full planograph, we can kind of reduce this into the cycle which forms a face with a certain embedding of the graph into plane. So it is a planar graph, so we can embed it into a plane. We can draw on a plane. And once we draw on a plane, there are certain faces here. And one of them we can consider it as an outside face, then we have some internal faces. And if you consider some, so this actually contains odd number of vertices, so add one more. So for example, if we take a cycle like this, then it also satisfies the condition above. It is a cycle, and outside we have a perfect matching. So this must satisfy the condition. We want to give an orientation so that the, in here, the number of backward edges is odd. However, we don't want to do that. We only want to first focus on the cycles which bounds the face. And we want to show that the, we o it's enough to only consider that. So let's see be a planograph with give, with a given embedding. I forgot to turn off the Wi-Fi. Sorry. And on orientation. of G satisfies 
the following. For every internal phase, the number of, I mean, fold or backward doesn't matter, but forward arcs in clockwise direction is odd. If this satisfy then E is far fiat. <coughs> so we want to prove this using the previous lemma. Let's say lemma A. Lemma B. So we want to claim that if this condition holds, then for any cycle C, the number of so forward arcs, so let's just say forward arcs is a forward arcs in clockwise direction. So every phase or cycle you can give clockwise orientation. There you can count the forward edge and backward edge. On the cycles has different parity. Then the number of vertices inside C. So we, we can fix one face as a outside face, then you can talk about inside and outside. So it's sufficient to prove this claim only. Because if what it says is that if you have a cycle and here we have two vertices inside, then there are odd number of clockwise edges. And if there are odd number, then there are even number of clockwise edges. So that's what it says. So it's enough to prove this because what we need to check is that because of this lemma A, we need to check that the, for every cycle such that its complement has a perfect matching, the number of backward oriented acts is odd. That's what we want to show. If we show that, then that, I mean, if this claim implies that condition, then we are done that this orientation is Fafian. So if you have a C in planar graph, arbitrary cycle, and if you know G minus vertices of C has a perfect matching, M, then M matches the vertices outside of C. Vertices, I mean, not having the vertices in C. But with this given plan embedding, C bounds a region. By the Jordan curve theorem, it bounds a region. So there is no way that the matching M connects two vertices, one inside and one outside. So in M, there are edges. Either both endpoints are either both, I mean, both of them are inside C or outside C. That means the number of vertices inside C must be even. So this claim says that there are odd many forward edges in C and odd many, that means it has odd many backward edge as well. Because G minus vertices in C has a perfect matching means C itself is an even cycle. <coughs> so it's suffice to prove this claim. As long as we prove this claim, then this lemma is done. So we prove this claim. How do we prove? We use the induction on say K, where K is the number of vertices inside. 
inside C. If k is 0, then what's the case? If k is 0, that means C is the cycle bounding phase. Cycle bounding internal phase. So, this given condition already shows that this claim holds if k is 0. So, assume that there are, if this k is not 1, then assume that there are more than one face inside C. I mean, you can consider, I mean, so we can consider that because if there are only one face and still there are, in, I mean, vertices inside, then that means, I mean, some trees are hanging in here. In that case, I mean, we are considering this In that case, this internal phase, if you, I mean, do the clockwise direction, so every edge hanging inside is counted twice. So, give me a moment, it's not well formulated. Uh, For every cycle C, the number of four orders on the cycle. Yeah, let's just assume that this is too connected. For now, let's not consider this situation. Yeah, I'm quite sure that the, this situation can be avoided in, I mean, easy way. But for now, I mean, I haven't prepared this case. Sorry for that. So let's just look at this case. So assuming this is, say, too connected, then there are more than, I mean, if there is a, at least one vertex inside C, then there are more than one face inside C. So partition C into C1 and C2. So we have C and C1 and C2. <coughs> Such that all faces inside C lies inside one of two. And let's say on this path there are S vertices, S internal vertices. So we don't count these two. So let's say, I mean, this to this is S. For each i, either one or two, 
let f5 be the number of forward clockwise edges in c1, ci. And say ki be the number of vertices inside ci. So by induction hypothesis, what's the induction hypothesis? Induction hypothesis says that fi and ki have the different parity. So f1 plus k1 and f2 plus k2 are both odd. And let's say this path is P. It has S internal vertices. Then in this clockwise orientation and in this clockwise orientation, no matter how these edges are oriented, it's counted for one, it's counted as a forward edge, but for the other one, it's not counted as a forward edge. So they, they are counted as a forward edge to exactly one of C1 and C2. So then C contains K1 plus K2 plus S internal vertices and the number of forward clockwise edges on C is F1 plus F2 minus S plus 1. There are S plus 1 edges here which are counted by either F1 and F2 exactly. So you subtract that. Then, what do we have? We have k1 plus k2 plus, so this, this you add together, s plus f1 plus f2 minus s plus 1 is k1 plus f1 plus k2 plus f2 minus 1. This odd plus odd minus 1 is odd. So that means in C, the number of internal vertices and the number of forward edge, forward clockwise edge have different parity. So this proves the claim. <coughs> so it proves the claim, so it proves the lemma that uh, as long as every internal vertice, the number of forward, I mean clockwise edge is odd, then it is popular. And now to prove the Castellin theorem that every planar graph has a Fabian orientation, we only have to show that, uh, I mean, every planar graph, we can orient the edges so that uh, every face has odd number of four edges. So let's say we have a planar graph. G with a given embedding, consider a spanning tree T and we orient edges of T in arbitrary way. And T's are all ordered and then remaining edges are not ordered. I mean, t's, edges in T are oriented, but remaining edges are not oriented. We order the remaining edges into E1, E2, ET in such a way that EI closes a face. In other words, for the cycle C of T union E1 to EI, 
a containing EI, no edges in EI plus 1 to ERET lie inside C. So what it means is that uh, if you have this spanning tree, Once you want to add this edge, once you add this edge, this encloses the face. In, I mean, internal face. We forget about, the, we don't consider outside face as this face. So it encloses this one internal face. But what if this is e, uh, E1? What if there is another edge E inside? So in the actual graph G, this face might not be the actual face. This may be a union of face. Then we don't take this E and we now consider this new E. And then check whether this is an actual face in the entire graph. If not, that means there is another edge here inside. Then we delete, the, we don't consider the previous one and we consider this. You do, you keep changing this, then you have to stop at certain point. And once you stop it, then you let it be E1. And now with this graph, and you consider E2, you consider, you want to pick which one should be E2. You pick arbitrary edge and then you add. Again, this includes this internal phase. But if this is not actual face in the entire graph, that means there must be an edge inside. So you forget about the previous choice and you change. You keep change until you cannot, and then this is your E2. You write it one by one, then you get this ordering. So at the time of adding E2, T union E1 and in here if you add E2 then it closes the face of the original graph. <coughs> then what's good is that uh, you arbitrarily order T and then now you add E1. You have to decide whether to orient it this way or the other way. But it's related to only one face at this time. So you can actually choose one of these two ordering in such a way that this face has the odd number of clockwise forward edges. So for each EI in order, we orient this appropriately so that the enclosed face have an odd number of forward clockwise arcs. Then every time you only have to consider one face So you can always do this, then we obtain a Fafian orientation because at the end we can make this condition satisfied for every internal phase. We don't care about outside phase. The number of for the I mean edges in clockwise direction is odd, then this lemma make sure that the, the resulting orientation is Fafian. And more generally, in 1974, Ritter proved that any graph with no K33 subdivision has Fafian orientation.
So recall that the planar graphs are exactly the ones which doesn't contain K5 subdivision and no K33 subdivision. So this class is a bit bigger than planar graph. And even for that, I mean, we can find the Fapian orientation. So, so today we learned about this Fapian, which can be used to count the perfect matching. So next time we will learn about some random algorithm which can effectively check whether the graph has perfect matching or not. Yeah, thank you for listening.